This VI needs to generate the G matrix for our Hamming code encoder. The G matrix is composed of two submatrices, one, it, one being the identity matrix and the second being the P matrix. So let me begin by working on the identity matrix. So this built-in sub-VI called create special matrix has a number of different options. The two inputs that we need here are the matrix type. I'll set up a constant to indicate that we are generating the identity matrix. And I will go ahead and change this to a control for matrix size so we can see the results of varying that value. Now for our application, the matrix size for the identity matrix corresponds to Q, the number of check bits. The parentheses 3 indicates that the default value is supposed to be 3. So simply set the, value, set the control to 3 and then make it the default value. Let's take a look at the results of create special matrix and the white cells are the actual valid outputs so we, we see that it is in fact a 3 by 3 matrix containing uh, ones along the diagonal. Now we need to take the identity matrix as one submatrix and then put that together with the P matrix we can also use uh, many of the array operations to work with matrices. So just to give a sense of that, I'm using the uh, build array node. And I've selected concatenate mode on this one. And notice that concatenate mode puts the two su submatrices one on top of each other. And uh, we actually need them to be side by side, that is the identity matrix on the left, the P matrix on the right. Now the transpose operation is located here and you need to experiment with this a bit to find out how best to use the transpose operations. You might try these before the concatenate array or possibly after. You just have to work with it a bit until you figure out the best way to, to apply that. You may need to use more than one of these transpose operations too. Here's an illustration of how when transpose is applied on the output side of build array, now we see it doing the left to right. Now just to get a, a sense of how we work with results from uh, a, a method coming up shortly that explains how to make the P matrix values. We need to be able to go from an array of booleans to the matrix data type. So I'm just setting this up real quick as a 3 by 2 boolean array and attempting to connect that directly into the build array doesn't work. We have a, a data type mismatch this way. Now there's a conversion that we can apply that says take the boolean type, turn it into an integer, and the values of that integer are either zeros or ones. Notice we have the red coercion dot showing up right here. If you'd like to make it a little bit more explicit that you are intending to convert the boolean array into the matrix data type, we can convert the array data type to matrix. And the coercion dot in this case is indicating that it's converting the integer data type into a double data type. Now you can compare the two, or you can compare essentially this as the input result and see where it shows up in the output array. So again, we've got some reordering that's necessary there, and that's, that's where you can experiment a bit more with the transpose operation. So let me move on. I don't need anything here except for this control for the number of check bits. 
And I'd like to work on constructing the P submatrix for our overall generator matrix. So one of the main ideas for generating the P matrix is that we need to generate essentially uh, an arbitrary list of Q bit values and we have to ensure that we have a Hamming weight of at least two. That is, we have to have two ones, two or more ones for each one of these qubit values. So what I'm working on here is setting up first a calculation that says what are all possible qubit patterns we could ever generate. So if we have Q check bits, then the total possible arrangement of those check bits or all possible combinations would be two to the Q. So that's what I'm calculating here. I'll use this to operate a for loop structure. So the for loop structure then will step from zero up to the max value, which would be two to the Q minus one. Let's just take a quick look at the results of this basic structure here, just to confirm that we do in fact see the index doing what it ought to. And there we go, zero to seven. Now here we have num number to array. Let's check out what this does for us. Let me give myself just a little bit more room to work. The point of, of this conversion is to accept an integer data type and then turn out uh, an array of Boolean patterns that are the binary representations of those integer values. Okay, let's see if this makes sense. So the first integer was zero. We see all the Boolean indicators are zero. Next one is one. You see one, and then all the rest are zero. And in fact, what we have here is the least significant bit is showing up on the far left side. Now, I only want to keep Q bits worth of that result. So I'll pick up the value from the num to Boolean output. We have two options here, either length or index. If we leave index unattached, that says start at zero, and then I want to extract Q number of, of bits. All right, let's see how we're doing. Okay, now we're making some progress. We've got uh, a variety of qubit words to look at, or qubit patterns, if you will. This is not required, but I prefer to look at these in more of the conventional orientation where we have the most significant bit on the left side. And that way these are a little bit more familiar in terms of the binary representation of unsigned integers. So we've generated all eight possible patterns. Next, we need to somehow figure out which of those patterns actually has two or more ones. What we can do is count the number of ones simply by summing up all of the array elements for each row. Now what I was just illustrating there is that again we have data type conversions to worry about. So let me convert the Boolean data type to integer and then sum those up on each one of the, the rows. Let's see what we have. Well it looks pretty good. We see by core matching up the two we see that any place that we had a single bit active we have a one, two bits active we had a two and so forth. 
So that becomes our indicator of the number of, of ones. So I guess next what we could do is compare that against two and say that as long as that value is greater than or equal to two, that should be our indication that that's a good pattern to use for our P matrix. So really the last point then is once you've made the decision that one of those Boolean array rows is a good pattern that you'd like to use, then the idea is, well, how do you assemble that into a new array where you only keep the desired values? So here I'm testing my value to say, uh, if, if there is in fact two or more bits, then we'll use the case structure to give us one operation when that condition is true. And that operation would be to concatenate the row from the Boolean array to some new array that we're trying to generate as our finished output. Now the data type is unspecified at this point, so that's why the wire is black with the kind of dashed line associated with it. So the idea then would be to concatenate the result from your qubit pattern to the results that you like. So that's, that's what you're doing here in the true panel for the case structure. In the false panel, you'd simply pass the array through unchanged. So that way the array only grows whenever the case structure is evaluating true. Now to ensure that the array always starts with no elements, make sure that you create a constant out front. Otherwise, every time you run the VI, it'll keep growing the array larger and larger.